Great. So our next speaker is Griffin Garner. And Griffin has worked in Panama, Bolivia, Uganda, and was even a manager of a shark, shark research lab in the Bahamas. After graduating from Santa Clara University, Griffin was awarded a Fulbright to research climate resilience and coffee farming in Uganda, but he was unable to go because of the pandemic. Lucky for us, this opened up new opportunities for him to participate in this program, which has allowed him to pursue his lifelong passion for marine conservation. Griffin is a waterman. He is a surfer, a diver, a spear fisherman, and a fisherman with a US Coast Guard six-pack captain's license. So his background really made him the perfect person for this project, where he was able to bridge the gap between fishing and science. Oh. And the name of Griffin uh, Garner's project today is Converting Fish Waste to Fish Bait in California Trap Fisheries. If you have ever been fishing, you have probably used bait before. And let's be honest, bait is gross, smelly, and pretty unappealing. So why would anyone want to research bait for their masters? I had no intention of researching bait before starting this program, and I've been fishing my entire life. But here I am, and I've come to learn that bait is extremely important because it enables fishers to bring in high quality protein and make money. Without it, there is no fishing. It is also an underappreciated aspect of many fisheries, which are mainly focused on the sustainability of the targeted species, the catch, and not the bait but you cannot have one without the other. There are many different species used for bait, but here are some common ones for California. These are species in high demand uh, for bait, but also for their role in the ecosystem as food, for direct human consumption, and for aquaculture feed. And juggling all of these demands can put strain on these important fisheries. While there are many fisheries that use bait, like long lining, trolling, and hook and line, today I will focus on trap fishing. Trap fisheries in California use baited traps to catch target species like crab, lobster, and fish. And these are bait demanding fisheries requiring millions of pounds per season. Trap fishers use a variety of different species, techniques, and baiting methods, uh, or delivery methods for bait, including fish waste from processors. And you can see the center photo of a rock crab trap with tuna carcasses from a processor. Bait is also expensive for fishers and sometimes hard to get, making it one of the biggest limiting factors for daily fishing operations. And there has been little research on bait in California. This is one of the first studies, not just of waste to bait, but of bait at all. So up and down the coast of California, there are seafood processors. Processors produce large quantities of fish or of seafood byproducts like carcasses, skins, and bones after filleting. Some processors can produce 20,000 pounds of fish waste per week. And while some processors do their best to utilize this waste whenever possible, because there are limited outlets and just such a large quantity of fish waste in the state, we need more creative solutions for full utilization. So we have trap fisheries in the state that require bait, and we have processors that produce waste. This is where the project fits in to utilize this waste for trap fishing bait. I set out to investigate bait in California trap fisheries and to create an experimental bait product utilizing fish waste to benefit processors, fishers, and the environment. I worked with three commercial state trap fisheries, California spiny lobster, Dungeness crab, and rock crab. And these fisheries vary in their seasons, locations, and landing values. And these are really important fisheries for California, not only because they are sustainably managed and have high landing values, but because they provide the state with great, delicious local seafood. So I had three main approaches for this project. First was conduct fisheries observations or field observations. Second was to create the waste debate products. And third was to field test them. Firstly, I had to figure out what was happening with bait in these three fisheries. What species were being used, when, in what form, and how much. So I did a lot of fishing. And I had many dark early mornings and long days at sea with the goal of observing current practices and to look for opportunities for integration of this research project. 
The next step was creating the waste to bait products. And I worked with Catalina Offshore Products, which is a local seafood processor here in San Diego as a case study. There I had access to fish waste as well as trap fishers who buy bait or bought bait and sold their catch to Catalina. But the main purpose was to figure out how a processor would integrate this waste to bait product system into daily operations. We decided that grinding up the fish waste would be the best for both processors and fishers. Processors can cut down on storage space needed uh, for their fish waste, and fishers can free up some deck space on their boat as they routinely need three to five large trash bins full of bait, but with the ground bait, you might only need one or two. So how do we grind up the fish? Industrial size grinders are expensive and we needed a cheaper option. So I bought a used wood chipper for $175 <laughs> and began the hilarious and smelly journey of trying to grind up fish. It, it did work, I promise. So through trial and error, I was able to take fish carcasses and turn them into a usable raw material. And we settled on three delivery forms to test out. Five gallon buckets, 30 to 50 pound frozen blocks, and prepackaged bait cups. And now that the baits were ready to go, we had to, the next step was field testing them. And this was challenging. Fishers were really hesitant at first to throw new bait in their traps that might not catch anything and interfere with their ability to make money. So to help this process, I got all of my commercial and crew member licenses so that I could actually work as a deckhand while doing the research. So in exchange, the fishers got free labor and free bait. There are many variables that affect bait testing like weather, tide, waves, and scavenging from non-target species, which make it difficult to assess the bait's ability to fish. Also, how well did the traditional baits fish or the current uh, baits used by the fishers? This was a really important question and one of the drivers for why this project was needed. Can we replace traditional baits like squid, mackerel, and sardines that can be used for human consumption with fish waste to produce the same catch results? So we did field testing with four fishers in three different fisheries. But today though, I wanna focus on my research in Northern California. I did two road trips up the coast to meet with 15 Dungeness crab fishers, visit nine seafood processors, and field test baits. I visited Morro Bay, Santa Cruz, Half Moon Bay, and San Francisco. Compared to the rock crab and lobster fisheries, the Dungeness crab fishery stands out in two main ways. The first, it has, it, the first is it has the most variation in bait types used, or bait species used. This first graph here shows the different bait types used by the 15 Dungeness crab fishers that I met with. And you can see that squid, hanging bait, mackerel, mackerel, and sardines, these were all really common and used by most or all of the fishers that I met with. And it's important to note that hanging bait is typically fish carcasses from processors stuffed in bags and hung from the inside of the trap. The chart also doesn't represent how much of each bait type is used, just what kinds they are utilizing during the season. So the second way the fishery stands out is it had the most variation in baiting devices used as well. Fishers will use chewy bags, Scotty cups, bait clips, bait jugs, and even little glass jars for clams. The line drawings here represent some common baitings for Dungeness crab traps. So from top to bottom, you could have two Scotty cups. You could have a Scotty cup and a clipped carcass, or a Scotty cup and a chewy bag. Meeting fishers excited and willing to test out baits was key to the success of my Northern California research. Meet Heather Sears holding the fish and her boat, the Princess, a 42-foot trawler. Heather runs and owns Princess Seafood, which is a processor and market in Fort Bragg. She is a commercial fishing boat captain, and Heather, along with her all-female fishing crew, fish for Dungeness crab, salmon, and albacore tuna. As soon as I met Heather and we discussed the project, she loved the idea and was willing to test out some baits for me. So in order to field test, she needed 150 pounds of frozen ground bait in 30 to 50 pound frozen blocks, which is standard for what she receives her other baits in. The plan was for Heather and her crew to do the set, and I would go out on the hall to record catch data. Well, we ran into some obstacles. 
While the Dungeness crab season usually goes until June or July, because of whale entanglements this year, the whole season closed on April 20th uh, for California. So now instead of having two weeks to figure this all out, we had less than a week. And I don't know about you, but I have never attempted to ship 150 pounds of frozen ground fish before, and it turned out to be more difficult than I was expecting. <laughs> but thankfully, though, we were able to ship the bait on Alaska Airlines cargo, and we got the bait up to Heather in time. However, when Heather went out on the set to put, more, to put the bait in our traps, we ran into more obstacles. First, Heather's boat broke down. Second, one of the bait blocks was still too frozen to use. And third, one of her crew members tested positive for COVID. So now up in Fort Bragg, after traveling all the way back up there and receiving this news, um, due to the COVID situation, I had to decide not to go out fishing. Thankfully though, Heather was able to collect data for me and I really could not have done this field testing without her. Before I go into the results, I want to quickly explain how Dungeness crab traps are set. Individual traps are set in a line to form a string of traps. And the traps are not all connected. And Heather typically sets 20 traps per string, but the amount can really vary from fisher to fisher. So here's a snapshot of the results. Heather was able to take photos of each trap as it came up onto the boat for two strings. And then I counted the photo or the crabs from the traps from the photos. This graph here shows the average number of crabs for two strings, the jackass string and the upper Usal two string. Experimental bait is in red and traditional bait is in blue. The jackass string is Heather's best producing string each season, so it catches the most amount of crabs. And because the season was closing, she didn't want to do an even split of traps. So she did 19 traps with the traditional bait and four traps with our experimental bait. And you can see the experimental bait caught an average of five crabs per trap, while her traditional bait caught an average of 21 crabs per trap. So not great. <laughs> but for the upper Usal 2 string, we had some more positive findings. So this time, there were six traps with the traditional bait and 12 traps with the experimental bait. And Heather also doubled up on the experimental bait, so she did two bait cups per trap and a longer soak time of seven days. And you can see the experimental bait fished better, so it caught an average of 10 crabs per trap, while the traditional bait caught an average of 16 crabs per trap. Heather and her crew were doubtful after the first test in the jackass string, but to her surprise, the experimental bait caught more crabs, and she was interested in doing more testing in the future. And considering the early closure and all of the other obstacles that we faced, this was a success to be able to even complete the, the field testing in the first place. So I want to switch gears back to San Diego. So, this, so now after taking everything I learned from field testing in Northern California, I did field testing with one rock crab fisher here in San Diego. And this time I was able to go out fishing myself so I could collect data on um, the number of crabs per trap for three of the strings that we tested the bait in. And this graph is just uh, results for one of the strings, string two, which had four traps. Experimental bait is in red, again, and traditional bait is in blue. And you can see the experimental bait fished similarly to the traditional bait for this string. And in some cases produced more crabs per trap than um, traps with the traditional bait. And when looking at the catch results for all three strings, the experimental bait, or for all of the field testing we did, the experimental bait caught an average of seven crabs per trap, while the traditional bait caught an average of 10 crabs per trap. So the rock crab fishery definitely had the most promising results um, out of the three fisheries that I worked with. So in the end, I successfully created waste bait products that we tested in three commercial trap fisheries. This diverted fish waste into a valuable product for California, tra for California trap fisheries, decreasing waste and improving sustainability both ecologically and economically. This project also revealed an opportunity to study the efficacy of traditional baits, since there has been little research on this topic. I believe this project can be used as a case study or model for future collaborative fisheries research, where processors, fishers, and scientists work together to cultivate benefits for all stakeholders involved. 
Ultimately, this is a huge area of importance for fisheries that gets almost no attention, and I hope this project gets the ball rolling on bait research in California and beyond. For project next steps, I received funding from the Sussman Foundation to continue bait testing in the local rock crab fishery this summer. I will also look into opportunities to further uh, utilize fish waste by connecting processors and farmers here in San Diego. I want to thank my committee, Dave Rudy, Sarah Mesnick, Mark Helvey, and Ross Hellner. I want to thank all the staff at Catalina Offshore Products for putting up with the smell of the wood chipper and the noise of the wood chipper. <laughs> I want to thank Samantha and all the staff at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I want to thank my friends and family and my MAS NBC cohort. And a special thank you to all the fishers who helped out in this project. They truly opened up their world to me and I will always be grateful for their participation and kindness. Thank you. First of all, that was awesome. I love that idea um, and what you've done for your project. And I think this is more of like a clarifying question, but for the, the fish waste, we saw that big picture in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is just normally thrown away. It's like, it literally just isn't used at all. Uh, no, it is used, so that's a good question. I didn't really have that much time to cover this um, in the project or the presentation, but there are outlets that are currently used for, that are for fish waste. Um, I talked about the, the f connecting farmers at the end. Um, processors like Catalina Offshore Products will give, there's a, f um, a farm called Staley Farms in Escondido, and they've already given like 217,000 pounds of fish waste in the last, I think it's two years. Um, so that's an outlet. Um, sometimes processors will sell the uh, fish carcasses to uh, pet food companies or the fish waste to pet food companies. Um, and they also will sell it to the trap fishermen or give it to the trap fishermen for bait. So there are outlets, it's just, there's the scale of the, the or the, how much volume there is in the state of fish waste. It's really hard to, first of all, say how much is out there um, and then how much is actually being utilized. But there is a new law, SB 1383 in California, which is um, a new organic waste law. So that is gonna make it harder for, it'll increase transparency and make it harder for um, processors to, or just like food producers to dispose of organic food waste. So it, it hopefully will increase um, utilization of this, of this resource. Got it, thank you. Such a cool project, uh, really innovative and sort of outside the box. What, what were your favorite parts about working on this capstone project? Um, I, I enjoyed really the whole project. Um, I, my favorite part was definitely getting to know the fishermen and um, interacting with them. They're definitely some of the most, uh, the kindest and the hardest working people I've ever met. And I think in general, fishermen get a bad rep, um, especially commercial fishermen, but they were super nice and just really welcoming. Um, I did enjoy grinding up the fish with the wood chipper. <laughs> it was a good stress reliever uh, during this capstone project, so if you ever get the opportunity, I would suggest uh, trying it out. <laughs> Are you planning to set up a company to do this on a commercial scale? <laughs> Um, no, I'm not at, at the moment, but that was, so when I pro started this project, it was, I thought I was going to be, I was focused more on the product production side, um, and I quickly realized that just wasn't feasible with the amount of time I had for this project, and I didn't really know much about commercial fishing, so, def I, de I definitely do, I think, um, you know, if, if processors could set up industrial sized grinders, like a grinder you would need to, to do this are expensive, um, you know, it could be like twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So, you know, if processors or um, fishermen set up cooperatives or work together to set to set up a centralized facility, there's, I mean, I, there's, you can use this for other um, reasons, not just for bait. So, if you ground up this material, you could you could sell it to pet food companies, give it to farmers, use it for bait. So, there's definitely there's definitely potential in uh, 
in starting a business for sure. Um. <laughs>